Oh, can you see my slides, please? Great, thanks everyone. Um, great, uh, thanks Ed for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, I've been a little bit cheeky. I've put two titles on the slides now, mainly because I thought I might throw in a little bit of extra something that I felt might be suitable for the day. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna talk about is modeling infectious disease transmission potential as a function of human behavior. Some of you might have seen this before. I presented it a few years ago at the uh, conference organized by London School in the Lake District. Um, just to set the scene a little bit, I did a PhD in cultural evolution anthropology, uh, which was using SIR type models, but it's all very theoretical. And there were, you know, I didn't have data inputs. And this is the sort of thing that I would say at the moment, you're going to, it's going to be very difficult to perhaps validate. So just going into this, bear in mind that the talk I'm going to give, it's more of an idea. It's more about trying to take theories from behavioral science as applied to um, health behaviors, turn that into some sort of mathematical function. Um, I'd be happy to hear any thoughts on that, whether you think it would be possible to get data to parameterize this sort of thing. Um, whether you think it would be useful in response in any way, but just at the moment, it's a little bit removed from what I'd call responsive work, and it's more a separate research topic. So moving on. Oh. There we go. Um, so this is some work that I started back in, I think, with uh, mainly me talking to Dale Weston, who is a behavioural scientist at, uh, was at PHE, probably UKHSA now, uh, Ian Hall and Maria Becker Nielsen. Um, and it was part of a project called Pantub. And we finally got it out on MedArchive, but still never got it into a, a journal, mainly just because the pandemic came as we were trying to get it published, but maybe one day. Um, and the setup is that I was working on a project where we looked at infectious disease transmission within a transport hub. Um, and one of the work packages, some of the collaborators actually went to Helsinki airport and took swabs from different surfaces around the airport to try and find areas of, which they defined as hotspots, you know, high viral load presence uh, to try and identify potential risky areas. And what we've done is taken one of those, which is, as the picture shows, when you go through, through airport security, you have to put your bags on the tray and send it through. And the actual trays that you handle were highlighted as a potential risk area because there was virus found on there. And obviously people are touching those often. And at least this was all pre-pandemic times. I don't know about now. Those were not cleaned very often. Um, but I should just point out that the model we're presenting here is looking at what we're calling contamination. So that would be the passing of virus from the tray to a person's hand. And if we're thinking about probably a respiratory virus, you know, that, that is not the same as infection. Um, I am not gonna go into the literature behind fomite transmission. Um, from everything I read about it, it's very mixed as to whether that is a key route of transmission for respiratory viruses. But we, we considered it a potential, a potential route, hence the, the model we've got here today. Um, so the way that we set up the model is we now know that this risky area is passing through luggage screening and the handling of the trays. And please remember that this was before the pandemic where finding hand gels in every location that you went to wasn't common practice. So we decided to have a look at the idea of, say, you know, you've got this area, you want people to have a hand hygiene intervention. You could, for example, put hand gel just before people pass through the luggage screening area. So before they touch the trays or you uh, hand gel afterwards. Uh, the reason this could be interesting for explicitly modeling human behavior is because if you are an individual who, before you touch the tray, sanitizing your hands would then be an other protective measure as in you're not putting you're not stopping any risk to yourself at that point because you've not contacted anything that could be risky whereas if you use hand gel after you have touched the trays that's the situation where you yourself might be at risk so that then becomes self-protective and then 
that's where the behavioral science models come in. So very quickly, this is um, the model setup that we used as a decision tree. So if I just talk through this, you imagine a person arriving at security screening and then they might be contaminated on arrival, as in they may have the infection on, on their hands that they can pass onto the trays. Um, and then you have a probability of pi of being contaminated, so one minus pi of not. And then they have this option given in the square of use hand gel, do not to use hand gel or not before they touch the trays. Then you touch the trays and then the tray is either contaminated, which means there's a chance that could pass to the person or the tray is not. And then you can choose to use hand gel after. So this is what the model itself looks like with the probabilities on there. So as I mentioned, the sort of question of interest that we had was, does placing antimicrobial hand gel before or after luggage screening most reduce the probability of contamination? So really you're just trying to look at this as an optimization problem of if we have this one resource of one, one container of hand gel, should we put it before or after to get the most benefit out of this? Um, and we can do this by comparing the two scenarios of placing gel before and placing gel after. Um, what we find is that the, pro um, the probability, sorry, if, if compliance before and compliance after, didn't talk about compliance yet, compliance is whether people use the hand gel. So there is, the theory which I'll come on to talks about giving a health message and it's interested in whether people comply with that given health message. Um, if compliance before and after is equal in that nothing changes, people will just use it the same amount before or after, then um, you should always really be placing the hand gel afterwards. So the probability of contamination, given you've used gel beforehand, is always greater than the probability of contamination of using the hand gel if it was afterwards. So the optimal situation is hand gel after people have handled trays. Um, but where it, the behavioural science aspect came in was looking at compliance and if compliance before is not equal to compliance after. So this is where we choose to look at the extended parallel processing model by Witty. So this is then a psychological model of behaviour that is specific to health protective behaviours involving messaging. And then an individual's compliance with a particular behaviour can be split into two components of perceived threat and perceived efficacy. So perceived threat is regarding how much they think they are in, in danger from a given situation. So in, in the model we've got here, that's to do with how much do they individually believe they might come away contaminated on their hands. Um, obviously during COVID, you could look at all sorts of different behaviors that people have had to have, you know, mask wearing, for example, or maybe people, whether they want to go into the supermarket or whether they want to do online ordering, things like that their perceived threat might come into that. If they believe going to the supermarket puts them really, really at risk of getting COVID, they might say, no, no, the risk is so high that affects their decisions. Um, perceived efficacy could then be to do with the intervention. So you now say, should I go to the supermarket? Should I order online? Well, I believe that every person in the supermarket will be wearing a face mask and I believe face masks are really good at reducing transmission. Therefore, I believe it will be a safe environment because there is some health protective behavior that that will be helpful to to reducing the threat to reducing the risk so that is the two components within the extended parallel processing model so we then formulated these with a mathematical equation and we made some assumptions um, in our situation with the luggage trays, we've assumed that an individual will perceive threat before 
as being less than threat after. So this is what I mentioned at the beginning. Um, because you've not gone in and you've not touched anything at the beginning, why would you perceive a threat? That's, that's very unlikely. Um, for mathematical convenience, though, rather than making these discrete as no threat versus threat, we've actually put them on a continuous scale, but we're just assuming threat before is like at a very low end, so very close to zero. Um, for this particular situation, we, we're setting efficacy before to be equal to efficacy after. So what this is regarding is we're saying that the use of hand gel, an individual will believe that that is just as good at cleaning their hands whether they use it before luggage, luggage screening or afterwards. And then we define what we're calling the compliance function, which is then a function of two variables of threat and efficacy. And part of the work that we did was choosing a functional form for this. And then what we're really interested in is finding out if it's ever beneficial to put hand gel before people touch the luggage trays, because earlier we've said that it's always optimal to place it afterwards. So we just want to find out if there's an area of parameter space where that switches. And the mechanisms behind that could be if individuals perceived, for example, very high threat and very low efficacy in that two parameter space, you might get different results to low threat, low efficacy, for example. So the way that that could come into something that could be real world applicable is if threat if individuals perceive threats maybe you can reduce the amount they feel that by better messaging or better communication of messages so that's how you could get a practical application from some of this okay so the the first thing that we tried to do was choose a function that was just efficacy multiplied by threat and you can see the plot in the corner just shows the shape of that function um, if you can I don't know if you can see the label very well but we've got the t axis for threat and then the I think the label's not showing brilliantly for the efficacy axis and then the, the height is the the compliance so we find that if threats increasing, we get higher compliance. If efficacy increasing, we get higher compliance. That's our assumption here. This is a very simple function. However, based on the literature of the extended parallel processing model, this, this could be suitable. Um, in, in this situation, using this functional form, we still find the same conclusion that you should always place the hand gel after luggage screening to minimize the number of contaminated individuals. However, the extended parallel processing model, you can also interpret there to be what they call the inverted U shape. So this is a situation where if an individual perceives a threat, initially, as, as the perceived threat increases, their chance of compliance increases. However, they might reach a situation where they perceived threat is so high the recommended behavior they believe to be not very effective at all so now you've got a high threat very low belief in the efficacy of the behavior and that can elicit a fear response in an individual and in a fear response situation it's possible that individuals do not follow the messaging so they essentially get so overwhelmed by the situation that they just sort of lose faith in the message and they don't comply um, and in that situation we see from the the orange yellow chart that there is a slight curve to the compliance function uh, what we find in this situation is that essentially you get regions of threat efficacy parameter space where placing the hand gel before screening is sometimes optimal So like the main conclusions from this work, because I appreciate this is very removed from the real world. It was just an example of firstly, trying to take an existing behavioral science theory related specifically to health messaging 
and like suitable for health messaging in, in epidemics, pandemics, um, and just showing that it is possible that underlying assumptions about human behavior could result in different optimal strategies at the end of the day. Um, but obviously, as I've said at the beginning, you know, we don't have any data for this. It's not very easy to sort of validate a, a psychological theory of behavior. Um, so it would be great if we could maybe test this out a little bit more, but also this is a very, very simple model. It was for a very particular project, which is why it's set in that rather strange airport setting, but there's more we could have done with it if we'd had the time, you know, we, you could have stratified your population down into different types of people, for example. So if you are there as a parent with children, does that affect your compliance with a health message compared to if you're there on a stag do or a hen do with friends compared to if you're a solo business traveller? And all those factors might actually influence whether somebody complies with the health message. So ideally, it would have been good to extend it a little further to look at some of those things. Um, so I'll take questions at the end about that. I'm just going to switch to a completely different topic now, just because um, I'm here and I wanted to maybe say thank you to the guys who uh, used the data that I sent to SpyM for months and responded when I didn't know if anyone was using it. So this is just a little aside to say that during the pandemic, I know that many of you probably did use mobility data in some very complicated models that were probably very interesting. Uh, I didn't do any of that. However, I did just run the data stream uh, for Facebook data at Imperial. And whilst we didn't try to do any modeling, any prediction with that data, I think that the data itself was really quite interesting just to take a look at. So a paper on this. But just a couple of things that we looked into. I don't know if anyone else spoke about this or will be. But what was interesting was we had two separate mobility data sources for a while, uh, one from a mobile phone company and the other one was for, from Facebook. Um, on the chart, the blue line is Facebook and the red line is the mobile phone company. And you see that Facebook doesn't start at the beginning. So Facebook data only started from around the 10th of March, by which point a lot of people in the UK had already changed their mobility habits. So it was quite interesting for us to just do some of some different sources to kind of verify that the Facebook trend lined up with the mobile phone data trend. Um, so that going forwards, we didn't have to carry through two different data sets. Again, if other people have worked with these, I'd be interested to know how you found it because there were a lot of issues with trying to use data from private companies like they agreed to it for a little bit. Um, however, data, uh, Facebook, you just had to sign up and then you could just download whatever you wanted. So at Imperial, we were running this uh, data pipeline for quite a while and sending stuff into SpyM. Um, yeah, and this was just we had a quick look. The red dot is the day that I think the government announced the proper hard lockdown, the sort of about four, four or five p.m. on the 23rd of March. Um, essentially, the more green it is, the less people were moving around. Like we saw in the other chart from the Facebook data in, in the UK, people had already kind of stopped moving around as much even before the official announcements of lockdown. But you do see like the, the Monday, which where the red dot is, is a little bit more yellow than the Sunday. So basically some people were still traveling a little bit even before the, the fully enforced lockdown. And then the other thing that we did with this data, which was again, just sort of descriptive and, and looking at it. Um, this is taking the Facebook data forward through 2020 from March, April, May, and fitting a segmented linear model to it. And essentially you actually see that over lockdown one, so this was being done at the time, so it's a bit more, a bit more key information then. But over lockdown one, people did start moving a little bit more. So I know there's sometimes the view that oh, lockdown one, everyone stayed in and was super strict and didn't break any rules. And it's like, well, okay, they probably didn't, but people did stop moving a bit more. It's like for a couple of weeks, everyone was terrified and didn't go anywhere, and then it started to ease off a bit. Um, 
yeah so that was all i wanted to show there and really the facebook was just because i know some of you guys probably used it in your models so i hope it was useful and that's all from me today thank you very much caroline very very interesting talk thank you for that so um well i'd like to invite any any questions for caroline please there is one that um, there is one that came up sort of a little while ago at about quarter to two from William Waits, who says, with the EPP model, do individuals update their beliefs because of experience in multiple rounds? In multiple rounds? Yes, yeah. You can, you can look at it in chat for yourself as well, if, if you like. So it's with the EPP model, do individuals update their beliefs because of experience in multiple rounds, Caroline. I'm just not sure what's meant by multiple rounds, but I will just say that this was can like clarify. a very. Can I can I clarify? Yeah. Um, just you know, if I imagine I'm going through an airport, maybe yep. I don't go through once in my life, right? Maybe I go through the airport, and oh, I find out I get sick, and so next time I go through uh, the airport, yeah. maybe I do something different, and I have a different belief about the threat and the and the efficacy of measures and these sorts of things. So I could imagine changing behavior over, over, over time. Completely. So what I'd say is like my model was nowhere near that advanced, shall we say, we were just trying to do a little proof of concept because everybody would be different. The intention would be to try and make assumptions about groups of people and block them off so that you might give an absolute perceived threat level for certain types of groups. So like I said, the solo traveler, or the solo business traveler um so in that sort of model framework we wouldn't really have a system for updating beliefs of a particular individual but um just speaking from what i guess would be more the behavioral perspective like you'd expect that to happen right previous experiences would inform the beliefs of an individual on their second travel third travel um yeah, I'd just say that the model we had couldn't couldn't handle anything like that. It was very basic. Well, thank thank you for clarifying that, Caroline, and, and thank you for the very interesting question, William. Um, I'm just looking at some of the, the things coming in on chat, and I think people are looking to change their behaviours around airport trays um, following uh, following this talk, uh, Caroline. Um, do we have any more questions, or would our, any of our esteemed academic organisers like to make any comments or raise anything? Uh, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, Caroline, uh, that was cool. Uh, just a quick question. Um, uh, Google released uh, and continue to release like uh, their kind of uh, mobility data. Is it really similar to the Facebook data as well? Because you showed that O2 was showing pretty much the same stuff. Right. And what would you say the biggest differences are? So uh how to put this in context so i was doing facebook data march 2020 and then i kind of kept running it through for a while but from march to may i'd say there was a group of us at imperial looking solely at imperial data so we had facebook we got this mobile phone data um from a couple of companies we got google we got apple i never saw google broken down to um the facebook data was broken down into tiles which we then aggregated mm. to ltla as part of our processing processing as imperial yeah. i did never i did not see google data broken down in that way i believe another team at imperial somehow got that data from google but it maybe wasn't publicly released is that what you work with do you work at like broken well, sort of five kilometer squares three kilometer squares with google data no that, they they themselves didn't use to break it down but they started breaking down by uh sub regions in most countries so, so like county level type stuff right so, so would you say the biggest difference is facebook opened up the kind of very uh, spatially resolved stuff easier oh yeah facebook facebook was yeah. great but i looked at it in the uk so like it was great in the uk because it's all through mobile phone uh, pings so mm -hmm. you know <clears throat> given you're in a, a country where probably a lot of people have location services enabled for facebook to give you mm. some sort of representative patterns um but yeah it's actually broken down to approximately five by five kilometer squares tiling cool. the whole of the uk 
you can have this data. You can never do as you never can really with these sets. Um, you can never track a mobile phone. So you can never say where a person starts and a person ends, which is the data we'd all love. But you can't do that. Thanks a lot. Could I just ask a question? Um, you said that you don't have data for to, to kind of uh, corroborate this, this theory, but it seems to me that your setup is ripe for, for an experiment. Yes. This is exactly the kind of thing that, you know, what behavioral economics is, is all about these days, you know, do an experiment. And it seems to be very clean and, and, and very apt for that kind of analysis. I think that my dream would be to understand how to do research where I could link up with people that could help me to do the right experiments because like I said, I did cultural evolution for my PhD, but I was on this very heavy math side of it. I'm aware that you can do like in computer experiments to get people's behaviors, to get frequency dependent behaviors, to look at influences of biases and behaviors. It's just, I have no idea how as a, researcher of my stage shall we say i link up with the right people to maybe yeah. push this forward but happy to chat more yeah i mean offline. The, the, sure i mean the, the, there are now textbooks on on you know experimental and behavioral economics that, that take you through the through the steps but uh, but sure be happy to talk great well, that's great. Thank, thank you so much. I think we, we're um, we're almost um, uh, up to five past two when we have our next talk. So, thank you so much, Caroline. Um, that was brilliant, and um, a couple of really interesting questions there. There was just something posted by Gavin Long to everyone. If you haven't already seen it in chat, it says Google release to LTLA-ish level mobility data reports around August 2020 things thank you for sharing that gavin so um without further ado and again thank you very much to caroline um if we can move on to our next talk we now have ed manley from university of leeds and ed will be talking about movement data for analyzing behavior during the pandemic thank you ed